with football season in full swing and France winning the World Cup. Back home in Singapore, there is one piece of news in the footballing community and in fact the larger sports community that has generated quite a lot of debate and that is with regards to the deferment of 17-year-old Ben Davis who has the opportunity to pursue a potential career in the EPL by, fulf by fulfilling his scholarship with Fulham and going overseas to play. But national service requirements in Singapore do not allow him to do so. He applied for a deferment and the deferment was denied, much to the rage and brohaha back in the online community. The topic of how national service cripples the chances of Singaporean athletes, be it in the digital realm or the embodied physical space, has been one that is consistently brought up as a reason as to why pursuing a career in sporting or gaming excellence is ill-advised. All male Singaporeans and permanent residents will be enlisted for full-time national service at the earliest opportunity upon turning 18. If you are at least 16 and a half years old and wish to be enlisted before turning 18, you can do so under voluntary early enlistment scheme. Now that is just an option, but most of the time, once you turn 18, you get the letter and that requires you to serve national service. There are quite a few deferments that are given in general, but these are largely with regards to the furthering of education or the completion of one's basic education. So I'm just going to read to you the policy that I, I found account on the Wikipedia page. pre enlistees are allowed to defer national service to complete full-time tertiary studies. Uh, most of the time, this does not include university unless you somehow are unable to enlist or enroll in the university before you are 16 up to the first pre-university qualification bar. So that's is your GCA levels or Polytechnic Diploma or its equivalent before enlistment for basic military training. Following this criteria, junior college students will automatically be granted deferment if they are less than 19 years old, secondary 4 or 20 years old if they are secondary 5. Polytechnic students from secondary school will automatically be granted deferment if they are less than 19 years old, if they did the, the O levels directly through Express, or if they did the N levels and then the O levels and then they are 20 years old. Polytechnic students from IT will be automatically granted deferment if they are less than 21 years old. Notice this in increase in age over here, or 22 years old depending on the academic stream. IT students will automatically be granted deferment, and cross IT streams will be granted deferment if less than 21 years old. A grace period may be issued if you're entering the second higher year of NITEC if you just reached 21 years old before the entry date. Private schools will be granted deferments if you're less than 19 years old or 20 years old. Now, this is the most common type of deferment that most, almost every Singaporean male who has to complete any form of education past the age of 18 will have to apply for and usually will be granted as long as they meet this criteria. So it seems to me that there seems to be a principle here that there needs to be the completion of one's basic training in terms of ability to enter the workforce. Getting a basic certification in terms of completing your A-levels A -levels, or getting a basic skill set from the technical institutes. But whereas if you look at sports, this is usually a very niche, or it can be classified a niche or a specialized area of tertiary education that people will be pursuing. Now, there are quite a few people outside of these conditions who are who have been able to successfully get deferment, pre-enlistment deferment, and I get this from a mothership article that I just saw earlier today. There have been seven people, uh, two of them are president scholars, one of which went on to do medical studies and then returned to serve in the military in an, in an enhanced position using the studies that he had done. Two of them were musicians, two of them were swimmers, uh, of course the most famous being Joseph Schooling and Kwa Teng Wen, and one of them is a sailor. So three people falling under the category that would be we'll be covering later, where people talk about the ability to win an Olympic gold medal kind of being the litmus test given the bar being set. 
and the two musicians in this case, there's no exact Olympics for it, but they were very clearly when the deferment was given, given this consideration because they were considered to be very prolific musicians and they had the capability to represent Singapore on the international stage in performing competitions. And we have to re-examine this later because when we get into the discussion as into the response that Ambassador Laj Bilahari made with regards to how we make these distinctions, whether these people are pursuing a professional career or they're doing it in service to the country as a substitute for serving the national service when they come of age at 18 years old. Now, let's look at the other options in which people look at, of course, forfeiting your citizenship or if you're a PR, forfeiting that, and then you'll never be able to transit through Singapore again is one of the more grim options. And I think that that's a worst case scenario. Nobody wants to have to choose that or seek medical exemptions. And that's something that I hear very commonly in the esports community. How can, how can I minimize the time, get a passive status, be it through the, the depression, faking depression, or, uh, I mean, whether if, if you do legitly have depression, yes, go, go seek help for that. But if some people are deliberately faking it so that they can get medical exemptions so they do not have to go through national service or getting doctor's letters to determine that they are not fit mentally and physically to be able to undergo these two years. And I think that these are things that we shouldn't really be looking at because there are there are very severe consequences for fitting a citizenship. Of course, that is the ultimate price to pay and all these things such as faking mental statuses, it actually creates problems for people who actually do have mental issues. So let's move on to the statement that was made by Ambassador Lodge um, Bilahari Kalsikan. And this is what he said in response to this Ben Davis issue. What I'm going to say will probably infuriate in many, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is an opportunity for the boy, but it is a professional or work opportunity. No different in principle from, say, an opportunity to study or work overseas, which many other male Singaporeans have had to defer to serve NS before taking up. The only difference is that this concerns professional football rather than, say, studying or working in some other field like accounting that does not arouse strong passions. So think carefully, folks. How is this different in principle? It is not as if deferment is to enable him to serve the country in a different capacity. If he is allowed to defer NS, what grounds can others in the same non-football situation be denied deferment? Now, my immediate response, my immediate response to the statement was that I felt that this kind of draws the line and it sets the kind of understanding that it is a very clear distinction. If you're doing it to represent the country, or if you're doing it as a professional or work opportunity. And this is where kind of the bad news comes into place if you're looking at things from an esports perspective. Because there, there's no exact national opportunity. We don't have a very solid, uh, we, we don't have an official body to say that this is a sport that's going to be happening and this is how we're representing the country. And in Singapore, we're not part of the IESF. So, we do, so we're not part of the CASPA branch of things, so we don't get to participate in the IESF as well. Uh, we talk a little bit more about how the ASEAN Games and the Olympics might change this. But what's important to note here is the line that he says that no different in principle from, say, an opportunity to study or work overseas, which many other male Singaporeans have had to serve their national service before taking up. And that, that is the key thing that we want to look over here. Now, this principle... This principle is also where you look at the history of the Olympics. From from my understanding, I, I'm no historian in this area, but from my understanding was that the Olympics was always a area that was pursued by amateurs. So they were not professionals. People who participated in the Olympics back in the day, they were not professionals who would play for clubs and who would play as paid people. They would be amateur there would be what many people consider uh, professional amateurs. So let's, let's, let's get into the terminology of this. What is a professional amateur and what is an amateur professional? A professional, a professional amateur is somebody who is not salaried by an organization and makes his living by winning 
prize winnings. This is kind of back in the Wild West days of esports, where you would go in there and you play a tournament and you use those prize winnings to to foot the bills, to to pay for what you're going to be eating the night itself, as compared to drawing a salary from a club or from a team or an organization like we do today. But this was eventually abolished as um, I'm not exactly sure what the reasoning behind it. I'm not, and I'm not sure how much of this is a conspiracy. But what what I heard was that it's because of the way that things were, of of the rise of the back then it was the communist countries because they didn't have professional organizations, so the athletes would just rise to the forefront and they would just dominate everybody, as compared to the other Western countries where they would have professional organizations and this would limit their athletes' ability to participate in the Olympics. So the line as to where we draw it between serving the country and pursuing a professional opportunity in today's day and age, where, where there is no very clear distinction anymore, where if you're playing in the Olympics, it is a professional or work opportunity. Yet at the same time, you're representing the country. By representing the country, that is your professional or work opportunity. Yet at the same time, is a professional could a professional or work opportunity be a means of representing the country as well? And this brings me to a very interesting response that I saw on my Facebook feed by by this person called uh, Tan Kwan Hien. So I'm gonna read it to you the, the whole thing and the, the important parts of it. Uh, it's, it's quite a long response, so maybe maybe I'll link it somewhere, someplace. I'm not sure if it's made public, uh, but here's the gist of it. He criticizes uh, Ambassador Large Bilahari Kalsikan's ideas that he's relying on too narrow a definition of service and contribution here, and it's being disingenuous when dismissing football because it merely arouses strong passions. I'll actually just read the whole thing. So why do we spend money funding the sport, sending teams overseas, building new facilities? Or why do we bother funding the National Arts Council, the National Gallery, and various other initiatives? There's a lot of flowery language you could use, but ultimately, we believe that it, A, it's important to get people invested in some shared and developed or culture. B, that these things, the sports, the arts, help to do that. There are also ancillary benefits insofar as doing well, may get us some positive international attention or make Singaporeans more inclined to do sports and be healthier. So somewhat like the argument that, yeah, we paid all the money to, to bring Trump and Kim Jong on in Singapore, but that's a very big payoff in terms of international attention there. To carry on. So in some meaningful sense, we can distinguish sports from other pursuits like account accounting in that Singaporeans may get behind a sporting talent or the truth be told, I'm not sure Singaporeans follow our volleyball team very closely, but are unlikely to get behind a team of chartered accountants, which is presumably why we don't directly fund Singaporeans at global accounting conferences. The silly thing is, we are already recognizing this when we gave Joseph Schooling and Kwa Teng Wen the first for national service. Swimming is also a sport, and clearly for schooling a professional opportunity. But schooling has nonetheless done more than enough for national pride and reputation to deserve a deferral. So the principle that something can lead to a deferral simply because it arouses strong passions is quite sad. After all, strong passions is what we want when building and making people invested in the national identity. The actual core of the question, which you've not really mentioned, is whether Ben Davis has the potential to contribute as much to national pride as schooling and Kwa Teng Wen did, when they first received their deferments. And this is subjective. Is it obvious that Davis would play in the Premier League? No. Was it observe, obvious that schooling would win an Olympic gold medal when he got his first deferment in 2013? Also no. On some objective level, it's also obvious that winning an Olympic gold medal in swimming is a much bigger achievement than playing in the Premier League. But then again, Singaporeans and the world care a lot more about football than swimming and watch a lot more EPL than the FINA Swimming World Cup series. I think many Singaporeans would be as excited to watch Davis play in the EPL as they were to see schooling in the Olympic final. And with all this due respect to Kwa Teng Wen, the bar has really been set at his performance level, which is a bit lower than schooling's. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pause here. There's a second half to this response, which adds a level of depth to this. But here's the way that 
what I liked about this response is that it really flashes out and it looks at this, once again, this dynamic. What's the difference between a professional work setting and representing a country? The way that they seem to do it, or the way that it seems to be qualified at the moment, it almost feels like an outdated process where it's reliant on the potential Olympic gold medal being the qualifying criteria, or be it an arts and gold medal, or wherever that exists within this Olympic body of, of recognition as to what constitutes national pride. And this response here points out a very good point when it comes to getting national pride, getting national identity. Would winning a medal in the Olympic final in a sport, maybe not as say mainstream as, as um, swimming, but something a little bit more niche like polo, would it instill the same pride that it did? Or would winning something in the EPL? So we're, we're looking at the, the two extremes over here. I mean, the Singapore national team is never going to be anywhere near the EPL. And this also adds a level of complexity to this because it could be that Ben Davis is being denied a very big op opportunity because he has bad teammates. And he does, he's not going to be able to get this opportunity despite being an excellent athlete because his teammates in the Singapore national team would not be of that caliber to reach an Olympic final or reach a World Cup final for that matter. And this actually leads to the meme where, where they see that um, Kylian Mbappe at 19 years old scores and wins the World Cup final. Uh, Benjamin Davis doesn't get the deferment in Singapore's FIFA rankings. It plummets to the lowest it's ever been. Or that's kind of a little bit of a causation over there. But it is true that as a footballer in Singapore, by this criteria, to look at your ability to win a medal, it just makes it so much more difficult because unlike an individual sport, you need 10 more people who are of your caliber as well to be able to get there. So let's move on to the second half of the response. It's not clear that even with a deferment, Davis would make the grade in the EPL, but it's obvious that without the deferment, his chances would fall dramatically as anyone who follows elite sports and the EPL even would casually know. And even if he didn't make the grade, if he came back for NS in five years instead of one, it's not clear what exactly is lost. Sure, we've broken the principle that nobody gets deferments, but we've broken that principle before and there's nothing magical about the word principle that makes it paramount. And we can always imagine an alternative principle, such as we should support Singaporeans who can make many Singaporeans proud. This supplants this one. Now, this is my favorite line in this response. We should support Singaporeans who can make many Singaporeans proud. This is a very utilitarian view. It boils it down to a very basic principle as to what is a, a means of deciding what's an ethical decision. And this is also one of the ways in which we can guide policy as well. What is an action? What is a policy that we can set so that it maximizes the amount of happiness, maximizes the amount of pride, or, or whatever form of utility that we are looking at in this case? And if we were to transform this into the esports context, I think this answers a lot of the questions that we have with regards to what games get deferments and what games don't. Because this is always the question that I think Skoga kind of has when they go up to it. Um, when I posed this question to them previously, the response that they gave me was that as long as you're a gamer, we help you in whatever way, whatever way we can. And there is this danger as well. If we move forward with this, are we going to start to have very clear categories or very clear measurements as to what games or what sports will inspire pride? And in this case, this esports, will seeing eyes, eyes, eyes playing in the international instill pride amongst people? You see, representative of a national athlete. The immediate response of the top your head is, yeah, definitely. He's, he's done he's done a sprout. He's one of the best Dota players that we have had. Uh, the likes of Chawi as well. Uh, but let's just stick to the eyes, eyes, eyes example. The last time we heard of him, the last time he made major news, is for using racial slurs on stream. This is a guy who has made a name for himself going on stream, uttering curse words and trolling people. And once again, this is where it gets very complicated because in a esports environment, you're playing on a professional level, you're representing yourself. And this is where it becomes blurred again. Does it mean that by pursuing a professional or personal work opportunity, you are unable to represent the country? And is representing the country not a professional or work opportunity as well? 
and this is something that we, we have to think about. And the rest of this response addresses this as well. Um, he, it criticizes the the potential Olympic medal bus criteria, and instead supplants it with his, with this idea that uh, would a world champion in chess promote national pride? Would a world chess player would a chess player benefit greatly from deferment? And who knows? So this also brings in the second question: How much time are we losing out on as professional gamers if we are if we're going to lose two years of our time to take a step back, move away from the current competitive scene, and then rejoin it? We have seen a few successful examples of this, but I have to say that from what I've observed so far, um, I've been in the League of Legends scene in Singapore for about five years, season three to season eight. And if you count all the way back to season two, season one, the names that we've heard, people who go into NS most of the time, they never come back into the gaming scene. Now, whether this is because of skill or because of other factors such as not being in school anymore or there being a lack of professional opportunities when they finish the national service or just deciding that the professional gaming life is not for them, uh, it's, another, it's a conversation for another time. But what I've seen in general is that you could draw a potential, you could draw a potential assumption that going into national service severely hampers your chances of making the grade as a professional gamer. It does take you away from things, and those people who have made it is still up the luck of the draw. They had eight to five postings, and if you have one that requires you to to spend a large amount of time in camp, and you only have the weekends, very limited practice time, I can see that there will be a relative decline in skill as well. Um, this is where the people who are more familiar with the Counter-Strike scene would probably be able to come up with, with examples to supplant this or to, to further elaborate on this area, but I'm not the most familiar. But this is a consideration that we have to take in mind. How much time are we actually losing? For a soccer player, this is where most of the talent develops. And if I'm going to approach this from a neuroscience area, if I'm going to approach this from a neuroscience area, if you're going to take out these two years from a player's time. Now this is where the process of malination is happening. In your teenage years all the way up until you're 21 to 23, this is where your brain is starting to develop for efficiency. The way you, you route your thinking, the way you develop habits, your brain starts to become a lot more efficient. And this is also why in general teens are tend to have ADHD or whatever funny term or attention or attention deficits today, or they tend to be more temperamental. It's because their, their brains are not efficient yet, the neural pathways, they're not insulated properly, so the brain's just firing all over the place. But if you keep thinking along certain paths, you keep exercising certain top, top processes, those actually become myelinated, that's the term for it, and it becomes a lot more efficient, a lot far more faster. So losing two years within this period, how much of it is it very damaging to that? Or even if we were to look at it the other way, we're two years in national service. So th this was the, the argument that was made as well by other people that getting the, the national service out of the way might actually be a good thing because it teaches you discipline, it helps you become a better person, and it changes your perspective in pursuing a professional career. <clears throat> so... The last paragraph of this response is that saying that there is a principle at stake misses the point. The point is whether this principle is valuable, whether there, it should be subordinate to other principles, and whether we have the courage to make those trade-offs even when the outcomes are uncertain. If Mindef had approached the matter in this way, rather than simply pointing to a rulebook and saying that the case was closed, I think Singaporeans would be less upset. A flexible and subjective process is not necessarily a bad one, and just because something requires interpretation doesn't mean it can be, can't be principled all the same. Now, to look at this in the big picture, the good news is that with all the Arsenal games that's happening and with this narrow focus on the Olympic Games or the Olympic body of games being the litmus test, this is actually some form, some, some form of good news for us with the way that esports has been shifting over here. Because it makes it easier for us to follow this rulebook in terms of getting deferment. But as an esports athlete, 80% of participation still involves players spending time with organizations as a professional career athlete, rather than spending this as an athlete representing Singapore. So, 
this is where things start to get very tricky, especially with regards to this. And this brings me back to the example of why, why I brought up Ice Ice Ice. And are we going to be granting everybody deferments just based off this criteria alone? And is this necessarily the best way we want to move forward about it? So I think overall, this is not a good sign for esports athletes wanting to seek deferment from national service. My personal experience working with this, um, by the time I started my journey in esports, I already finished national service. But when I brought Election Sekai Tan over to Taiwan, he is a top laner. I was coaching in Taiwan and I brought him over on the, uh, got an LA from him from school. And brought him over to Taiwan for one year to pursue a professional opportunity in playing in the Legends Master Series for Fireball. This was one of the topics that was brought up in the discussion as a what if. What if he excelled in the LMS and was in demand, but was time capped by his need to serve his national service? How possible would it have been to pursue a deferment? Back then, we said that we'll talk about it, we'll cross the bridge when the time comes, and hopefully we can bring him to Wolves. I mean, what actually happened has got nothing to do with this, but if we were to look at that situation and if he really did very well and he did become a world class a world class player the answer looking at this series of events is highly unlikely simply because this would have been considered a professional personal basis a work opportunity rather than one representing the singaporean flag now the immediate knee jerk rejection which is something that i would advise against which will be to funnel resources into developing esports as a national model. This is the criticism that I have all the times because if we were to examine the shortcomings of the esports ecosystem in Singapore, localizing a digital game into a national context for the sake of trying to attempt a means of qualifying players under the banner of national representation simply so that they can be deferred would be ill-advised. Not unless we are able to change the base model of what esports is, as an entertainment or media model, this approach is unwise in a country with such a small population and with our citizens spoiled for choice when it comes to entertainment. So is there another way out? Three years ago, I, I had this very big vision in terms of what esports could potentially be. And this was one of the topics that I, I did think about. And we are going to examine a different kind of deferment that regularly happens. So the first kind of deferment that regularly happens is that is one that allows people to complete the basic set of skills, the basic set of education, to complete the secondary school education, to complete the polytechnic or technical vocational education. The other kind of deferments that people always get is for medical studies. But this is not a pre-enlistment deferment. So what happens is that this is a special kind of deferment that's given to Singapore males who have completed basic military training, who are selected for officer cadet school training, so they're in the top percentile of cadets, and they get their results. They are accepted into a medical course in either local university, NUS or NTU, in some cases overseas universities as well. And then a deferment will be offered to them to disrupt their national service after six months of service. So they will complete their OCS training up to, I do believe six months and that should be up to their, I can't remember the term for it, but it's only completed up to a certain point. They would defer their training and then they would go and start a five years course in medicine. When they complete the course in March, they will get their exam results, assuming that they pass. They will start their one-year hospital housemanship with the Ministry of Health. And this is usually done in the service part of the bond, I do believe, and this is where they are attached to a medical center in one of the ministry camps. And so what happens is that there's this trade-off, but in total, they spend 11 and a half years completing their education and serving a form, form of bond with the Ministry of Health and the national service after that. So an 18 year old will go in, he will go into OCS and by the time he comes out, he'll be 29 to serve this bond. 
So this is kind of a, I wouldn't call it a deal of the devil, but it's a creative deal that we can potentially make. Because if we can say that going to national service can help people become better esports athletes or can become better athletes in general. But here comes the difficult part because there is a direct relation back from medical school to becoming a medical officer in the armed forces. If we are able to prove that there is a correlation behind people who are strong in leadership skills or people who are strong in certain games who are, be who are able to contribute back to the military service, I do think that this is a possible approach for us as well. If we can show that a holistically excellent individual could potentially be granted deferment in this area, so that they can go overseas and they can pursue pursue a career as a professional gamer, understand what it's like to be under a high pressure scenario, to make the decisions, what is it like to overcome crisis, telling the logistics around it. And on top of that, they have to serve six months first in the national service to see if they will be a good fit to become an outstanding asset to the armed forces in the future. Perhaps this kind of deal could be done as well. I mean, of course, there are multiple other possibilities, but this is what I see as a potential way out. And this is also about creating a larger ecosystem. Largely because of the amount of synergy that I see between the military as well as that of pursuing a, a career in professional gaming. Now, let's say the career lasts, lasts five years. You get them four years, five years. They finish their career in pro professional gaming and then they come back. They serve in the military. They serve a five-year bond as an officer whatsoever. They can choose to continue to sign on or whatsoever if they are really a very valuable asset. And these skills then moving on to be an officer would then serve as a platform for them to return back into the gaming field as a coach or support staff now armed with the ability to think in terms of logistics now armed with the ability to think in terms of manpower and how do you coordinate training and plan things out so that wraps up my thoughts on this ben davis issue uh today was my off day perhaps in the future i'll vlog about more league of legends related stuff